The scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The water rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. This is the word of the Lord. All right, we've been talking about change. That's what this verse uh, tells us a little bit about. Um, Speaking of, though, today, this morning, brought a really nice change, didn't it? You know what I'm talking about, yeah. It was actually cool for the first time in a long, long, long time. It's been a long summer, so uh, that, that was nice this morning. I hope that change lasts just a little while. That would be great. But most change that we deal with in our life uh, comes unexpectedly, and it brings disruption. Um, We are going along. Everything is fine, routine, normal. We're comfortable. And then something happens that throws everything up in the air. Some big change happens in our lives. And the question is, how how do we successfully navigate that change? How do we deal with the disruption that change brings? And for Christians, what we're wondering is, does our faith, our our faith in Christ, give us any kind of information and guidance about how to respond to these big changes when they happen? Well, uh, there's lots of places in the scriptures that I could turn to to describe this, but uh, there's a story I think that really gets to the heart of what it means to go through change. And that is the Noah story in the book of Genesis. So that is what we've been looking at. We're kind of coming back to it this week. And uh, we will be getting in Genesis chapter 7. Actually, verse 17 is where we will be starting. And uh, yeah, here it is, verse 17 It says that for 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. So many of us know this story of Noah and the ark and this worldwide flood that happened. Well, some really smart science people have kind of dug into the numbers, and if we are to take kind of the literal sort of version of this story, what would it take in order to achieve a flood of that proportion on the earth? So they went in, and of course we know the circumference of the earth, we we know the radius of the earth, Uh, we also know the highest point on earth, which is Mount Everest, well over 20,000 feet above sea level. Uh, We know uh, how much we need to add to the top of Mount Everest so that the ark would not run aground on the top of Mount Everest. So how much water would be needed in order to achieve that that depth and, and, and encompass the whole earth? Well, again, smart science people, and they have come up with Uh, The needed water, the rain that would be required, is 813,875,076 
cubic miles of rainwater. So just by comparison, how much water does the earth already have? How much water do we have now? And if you factor in all the the oceans and the lakes and the rivers and the ponds and I guess your backyard swimming pool, then we come up with this number. This is how much water the earth holds. 332,519,000 square miles roughly. So I don't know, you may not be good at math, but I hope at least you can see there's a discrepancy in these numbers. What that means is, in order to achieve the flood, there would have to be 250% more water than we currently have. And just to put that into perspective, that would be the equivalent of 10 Atlantic Oceans. 10 Atlantic Oceans. It would be the, the equivalent of... 1.35 1.35 quadrillion olympic sized swimming pools. And to achieve that, we, we know the time period, right? That this happens. The Bible gives us the time period. So how fast would that water need to rise in order to achieve that global flood level? Well, it would have to rise 150 feet per day. That's six feet of rain happening every hour. Has anybody ever experienced that? Have you been like in the depths of the Amazon rainforest or something and you've seen that much rain? Now imagine that rain occurring over 150 days. This is well beyond our scope of comprehension. This is, this is well beyond anything that we can imagine. Talk about change. Talk about a flood. This is the ultimate flood. So going back to verse 17, uh, it says that for 40 days, the flood kept coming. It just kept coming. It rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. Just put yourself in the shoes of someone who is witnessing this. Imagine you're on the ark, and every single day, you, you just see the water getting higher and covering more and more of the land on which you used to live. Imagine you're... You're way up high on a mountain in the Himalayas or in the Andes, and you're watching this water come at you. It would be unimaginable what it would be like to be in that. There's a Hebrew word that keeps showing up throughout this set of verses, and the the Hebrew word is gabar. And I think in the NIV translation, which is the one that's in your pews, and you may be looking at that right now, the, the, the word that's translated from gabar, the English word, is, is rose or rise. But this is one of those situations where I think that that translation didn't quite get the right English word. Um, because what the word literally means in the Hebrew is something that uh, conquers everything. It is stronger and more powerful than anything. Anything that can stand in its way. So other translations, and I think this is a little better, uses the word prevail. The waters prevailed over the earth. Nothing stood in the water's way. It conquered everything. In a couple of places, in verses 17 and 18, there's a word that gets added. Um, Usually it's translated greatly. So the waters rose or increased greatly. And that word is mayo. And uh, that just literally means with muchness, with with greatness, with overpowering strength. Just kind of is an adverb that sort of reinforces that original word of something that's prevailing. It's not just prevailing a little. It's prevailing greatly, muchly in in the, in the world. So, 
it's safe to say the flood had a scope and impact that the world is, it never saw before this and it has never seen since. It is a singular event. And um, we could spend the rest of this time sort of having a debate and going through all the options for the scientific plausibility of the flood, whether it's literally true as we see in the Bible, that would be a lot of fun. Maybe we could do that over a cup of coffee or a couple of beers uh, over the next week, but um, that is not a good uh, use of our time now because I think there's a more relevant, there's a more relevant question. And that question is, is this. What do you do when the floods of life come? Maybe not a literal flood, but a, what seems like a, a never-ending source, uh, never-ending troubles and disappointments, relationship problems, relationships at work, illnesses that just keep coming. Just keep coming. You don't get a reprieve. And not only do you keep coming, but they, it feels like they're prevailing in life. They're, they're defining who you are. Nothing seems to, to stop it. Nothing seems to make things better. The, the question is, when these things happen, what actually prevails for you? Does the flood prevail? Does the trouble, the frustration, the disappointment, the grief, does that prevail for you? In other words, does the water prevail for you or does the ark prevail for you? Safety, security, God's protection. What prevails in your life? When, when the floods come, do you feel like you're you're, you're in it, but you're floating on the top, safe. Or do you feel like you're under it and you got to do something in order to save yourself from the floods of life that come? And then the question is, what do you do? I, you have options. I was just thinking through this week. What, what could I do? What have I done when I have felt like I'm, I'm up to here with all the struggles and stuff that are happening in my life. And so I came up with a little list. And the first thing on the list was, of course, I could give up. I could stop treading water. This, uh, I, I can't do this. I'm just going to let myself sink. I'm going to let myself drown. I, I, can't, I can't face this flood. So you give up. Uh, you could rely on yourself. You could tell yourself, you know, it's just 150 days. I can tread water that long. Sure. I can do that. No food for 150 days. Great weight loss plan. It'd be great. I could do this. I could do this. I have it in me to do it. We could rely on others to come rescue us. Right? Maybe another ark comes along and hauls us aboard. We've, we've gotten used to in life that we can just kind of wait for others to come and save us, right, and rescue us. That's something that we could do. Uh, we could fight. We could fight back against the flood, dive down real deep and find that plug and pull it, you know, conquer that flood. Um, and then, of course, an option that is really imaginative that some people have, it's denial. It's basically saying there is no flood. Okay, everything's fine. Everything's okay. I'm fine. No problems. Everything's great. When you're, you're barely keeping your head above water. Okay, so those are all choices. Those are all options that can be followed, decisions that can be made. Maybe you have tried out some of these options in the past. What's interesting to me is that the Bible account doesn't speak about any of those. It doesn't offer up any of those as a viable option for surviving a flood. What it does offer is the example of Noah. And what does Noah do? 
He trusts God. And he does what God tells him to do. That's his best plan. And I would put forward that the reason this story is in the Bible this way is because it's your best plan too. That's our best plan when the floods of life come, is to trust God and do what God tells us to do. Let's be honest for a moment about what actually causes floods. What actually causes floods? Even if you go back to the Noah story, where it's obvious that God caused the flood, why did God bring the flood in the first place? It was because of humanity. Specifically, our wickedness and our corruption, and most importantly, our rebelliousness. God is our creator, God is our, our guide, and God is our friends. But what humanity has done over and over and over again is say, God, I'm going to acknowledge you, but put you in a little box, or I'm going to ignore you altogether. Because what I want to do is I want to call the shots. I want to be in control of my life. This goes all the way back to the beginning. And so it's something that I'm doing. I'll just speak for myself. I'm doing it. But I've met a lot of people who say that they're doing the same thing. And I've seen a lot of people do the same thing. And I'm just thinking of a world in which every single person is rebellious and short-sighted, and self-absorbed, trouble comes when those things happen. And we can pile them up, you know, where, where we can't see them, behind that dam, that dam's protecting us, those troubles can't get to us, but when that dam breaks, the floods come in our lives. They come at us, and they come at us, and they don't stop, they just keep coming. And they prevail over our lives. As we'll learn more next week, these floods that happen in our lives, they don't come from God. God makes a promise that he will no longer send a flood like he sent with Noah. He makes that promise. So that means that the floods that we experience today aren't God's fault. They're not God's fault. They're our fault. And the ways that we have broken God's creation. So what's God going to do about this? Is he just going to keep sending these Floods to wipe out everything and start over? Obviously not. That's not the plan because it hasn't happened. And I get the sense we've deserved it. How about you? We, we've deserved it just as much as the folks back then did. But it hasn't happened. Why? Because God has been bringing a different flood every single day since then. It has been a flood of righteousness and love and blessing. Unconditional love. Look at what it says in the Psalms. Um, go back go, go back a little bit. I, I know I'm out of order here. Where did the Psalm go? There it is. Look at that. The Lord sits enthroned where? Over the flood. So as you read this, what prevails? Is it the flood or is it God? God prevails over the flood because he is enthroned as king. He is enthroned over all things. It's, it's clear um, that God is greater than the flood. Um, if you take a look at what God is going to do in uh, Malachi, Take a look at this first. Now we're back on track. Um, God says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open, look at this language, throw open the floodgates. That sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 7, throwing open the floodgates. Different kind of flood though. 
floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough to store it. So much blessing. That's the kind of flood that God is bringing. How do we know that? Well, the scriptures say in the New Testament, because of our baptism. Take a look at this. This is in 1 Peter. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. But this water, the water of baptism, symbolizes that it saves you also. Now the water doesn't destroy, the water saves. Because of the baptism of the Lord where we enter into his family. And we have his protection. Those of us who have been baptized. There's this great old hymn that popped into my head. I grew up in the church, so a lot of these old hymns just kind of settled into my consciousness. And whenever I um, encounter something, I, these hymns just kind of speak to me. And this is a, a, a hymn called Love Lifted Me. Have you ever heard of this hymn? Yeah, and, and here's kind of the chorus. It says, I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. (laughs) Yeah. Love that hymn. That's what this is talking about. That's what that hymn is talking about. God's flood of blessing that's happening in our lives. There's just one more thing I got to tell you. And that is um, what that means for us. What it means for the church. What it means for us as Christians today. We know that God is no longer the the cause of floods, but we do know that many of our neighbors are in floods. They are barraged with trouble and suffering and hardship and sickness, depression, addiction. We are surrounded by people who are just treading water in their lives. And I think The final thing that this this particular story tells us is that as Christians, we have been equipped and called by God with the knowledge that, that there is an ark and these neighbors, we can invite them on. The ark isn't just for one family anymore. It is for the whole world full of people. And and our calling is is to let people know that it's there for them and to welcome them aboard so that they can experience floating on top of the floods of life. I pray that for us, you and I, Christians, in this coming week, that God would send into our lives flooded out people we, we will see that. They are, they are barely keeping afloat. And we will be able to say, friend, I know where there's an ark. And I know for sure there's a seat on it for you. Gracious God. First of all, thank you for this story. For some of us, it's a story we've known since we were kids. We would read it in our children's Bible. And it was fascinating to imagine such a flood what it would be like. But now as we grow older, we begin to understand that this story has a deeper meaning. It is teaching us about where we can turn when the floods of life come. And that the safety of the ark now has become the safety of the cross of Jesus. And it is there is a place for all of us no matter who we are or what we've been. And there is a place for our neighbors, our friends and coworkers, and family members, and fellow students. 
And you've given us the, the good news to share that they can experience that rescue as well. Help us to live into that knowledge. Help us to, to know that we float above the troubles of this life. We're in it, but it does not overcome us. It does not prevail over us. I pray in Jesus' name.